Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Debrief on ABC News Live. I'm Kimberly Brooks. Thanks so much for joining us. Death by suicide. We have the latest in the Jeffrey Epstein case. Plus, the protests in Hong Kong continue to escalate all across the city. And a song of hope in Dayton, Ohio, with John Legend. But first, here are your headlines. Lawyers for Bill Cosby will be in a Pennsylvania courtroom today appealing his sex assault conviction. 82-year-old comedian is serving up to 10 years behind bars for assaulting Andrea Constant. Top U.S. immigration officials are defending the sweeping crackdown on undocumented workers in Mississippi. Children were left sobbing because their parents were detained at food processing plants. Now the Trump administration is under fire for punishing workers and not punishing their employers. But officials insist the immigration crackdown will likely lead to charges against the companies. This was a joint criminal investigation with ICE and the Department of Justice targeting worksite enforcement, meaning companies that knowingly and willfully hire illegal aliens. In most cases, mm -hmm. they can pay them reduced wages, exploit them further for their bottom line. That's what this investigation was about. The crackdown took place as the president traveled to El Paso after the deadly mass shooting targeting Mexicans. The acting Homeland Security Secretary called the timing unfortunate. Relief for a Tennessee family now that an escaped prisoner has been caught. Curtis Watson is accused of killing prison administrator Deborah Johnson. Watson was caught after being spotted on a residential doorbell camera. Tesla has not yet commented on this fiery crash involving a Model 3. The driver says the electric car was in driver assistance mode, not quite full autopilot mode, when he slammed into a truck stopped on a Russian highway. He says he didn't see the truck and apparently neither did the crash avoidance system. That driver suffered a broken leg but escaped from the car. Previous crashes have raised questions about the safety of automation in vehicles. Tesla has said when properly used Used drivers supported by autopilot are safer than those without it. We begin with what is turning into a bizarre story. Jeffrey Epstein, the millionaire and registered sex offender charged with the sex trafficking of minors, died by suicide in his jail cell in New York City over the weekend. His death leaving more questions than answers. So I want to bring in Aaron Katursky uh, right here with me. And we also have Luke Barr in our DC bureau. Um, Aaron, I'll start with you. Um, you broke this story on Saturday. So I just want you to explain to us how this all went down. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein was found at 630 in the morning on Saturday, unresponsive officially. But but our sources told Luke and I that uh, it was fairly obvious what had happened at the outset, uh, that he had uh, died by suicide, a hanging, and the paramedics were called. They tried to revive him unsuccessfully, and he was formally pronounced dead uh, a short time later at a nearby hospital. And that touched off an instant investigation by the FBI mm. and also by the Department of Justice Inspector General because the Attorney General of the United States was said to be livid over this mm. as Epstein was about to face trial next year on counts of sex trafficking and sex trafficking conspiracy. Absolutely. And Luke, um, for clarity, he was on suicide watch before. Um, I want to know, was he on suicide watch at the time of his death? Uh, well, no, you know, no, he wasn't. Now, reports have indicated uh, that he was off suicide watch. Uh, and, and there's a big difference between being on suicide watch and being in the special housing unit uh, where he was uh, housed, which is that, you know, when you're in the special housing unit, you're checked usually uh, every 30 minutes when you're, when you're on suicide watch, you're checked by uh, officers every 15 minutes. Um, and clearly reports uh, have indicated that he was not uh, on suicide watch, uh, and the BOP has uh, confirmed that uh, in a statement over the weekend. And so, Aaron, um, when this happened, um, just that morning, lots of documents had been released uh, regarding this case. What do we know about those documents and what were in what were in those documents? Yeah, at the moment, it's purely coincidental that the documents came literally hours before Jeffrey Epstein took his own life. But the documents are part of a civil lawsuit uh, filed by a woman, an Australian woman, uh, Virginia Roberts, who said that she was trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein. The lawsuit targeted his alleged madam, is how she's described. She's a British socialite, uh, socialite uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, and mm. she was sued. And these documents, thousands of pages, uh, were finally 
released and unsealed, and, and they uh, speak to the bold-faced associations that Jeffrey Epstein kept. Uh, Virginia Roberts said that she was uh, meant to have uh, sexual relations with uh, the former governor of New Mexico, Bill Richardson, former Senator George Mitchell, uh, um, including ex and then Epstein himself. All these men have denied, by the way, even an association with this woman and, and say they never met her through Epstein, but it only fuels the, the conspiracy fire when it comes to Epstein's death because of the prominent company that he once kept and who may be, um, if not uh, uh, joyful necessarily, who may be okay with Epstein no longer being in the picture because had he yeah. stood trial, um, who knows what he would have said publicly to a jury. Yeah, what would have been uncovered um, in that courtroom. So, Luke, you know, what was the protocol? They also, um, there were reports that his cellmate was removed. What's going on in this investigation? So there, so there are a lot of unknowns right now, Kimberly. Uh, you know, the, the protocol is usually when you're in special housing, you can't have a cellmate. Uh, you know, but there are a lot of questions as to uh, what happened. Uh, we reported last uh, two weeks ago that Epstein uh, had a cellmate at the time that he um, tried to commit su tried to commit suicide. Uh, but just there are a lot of unknowns, and, and BOP uh, and DOJ and FBI are investigating right now, and hopefully we'll have some answers soon. And Aaron, we can't talk about this case without talking about the victims who um, really won't see justice. Not in the way that they certainly had hoped. I, I remember sitting in the courtroom after Epstein was first charged and he was brought in before a judge in blue prison scrubs. And one of the, the alleged victims commented that that, at the defense table in, in a prison smock, that is where Jeffrey Epstein belonged. And so that, that satisfaction, that measure of justice to have allegations aired in a criminal proceeding will not continue. However, his criminal case does continue. And federal prosecutors over the weekend noted that he had been charged with conspiracy. Mm -hmm. It takes at least two to tango in a conspiracy, as alleged. And so the possibility that other defendants may be named in the case, right now it was only Epstein in the indictment, but there's certainly the possibility of others charged. And federal prosecutors and the FBI still want women to come forward if they believe they were trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein, and the feds are promising to continue to evaluate those accounts. And before we go, um, is anyone going to be blamed, uh, if you will, for him dying? Well, there's clearly a number of failures, as, as Luke says. We know that the guards were supposed to check on, on inmates in special housing where Jeffrey Epstein was at MCC Manhattan every 30 minutes. That protocol was not followed. He should have had a cellmate. He was found alone. There are cameras in the cell block, but we're not sure that any were actually trained on his cell. And if they were, we're not even sure that they were working. Mm. So there's clearly a, a number of failures here. And the Attorney General, William Barr, who's been speaking in the Louisiana at an unrelated event just said he's appalled by the failures at MCC Manhattan. Yes. Um, so Luke Barr in our D.C. Bureau, Aaron Katursky right here with us. Uh, we appreciate the updates, guys. And we move overseas to a frightening story out of Norway. Um, as Muslims around the world were celebrating a major Islamic holiday, a 21-year-old man entered a mosque near Oslo and opened fire before an older man pinned him down. And thankfully, no one was killed in the attack. Um, I want to bring in James Longman in our London Bureau. James, good to see you. Um, a very scary situation. Where does this investigation stand? Yeah, I can believe absolutely terrifying for all concerned. And actually, we're seeing the first images of this young man, this 21-year-old uh, you mentioned there, in court today for a hearing. And actually, extraordinarily, he seems to have been pretty badly beaten up. He's got two black eyes, pot marks all over his face, scratches on his neck. Uh, it's unclear how he got these injuries, but he seemed pretty pleased with himself. He was smiling at photographers. But let's rewind a little bit to what happened on Saturday afternoon when he is alleged to have gone to the Al Noor Mosque, which is a mosque just outside of Oslo, the capital of Norway, with a number of weapons, we're told. One uh, eyewitness told local news that they saw two shotgun-type weapons on him. He was wearing a helmet, and he burst into this mosque, but was almost immediately uh, brought to the ground by a worshipper, 65-year-old Pakistani man, a former Air Force officer, brought him to the ground, took his guns off him and pinned him there, waiting for authorities to come uh, to the scene. He was a little bit injured in that um, altercation, but thankfully nothing life-threatening. Life but when authorities did 
work out who this individual was. He's being named, by the way, locally as Philip uh, Mann's house. When they went to his home, they found the body of a 17-year-old girl, and that turned out to be his stepsister. So authorities are charging him with her murder. But like I say, he appeared in court today looking very happy with himself, but prosecutors are uh, trying to get an extension to his custody time, want to keep him there for four weeks, want to make sure that he doesn't have access to the media during his time in prison because there is some suggestion that this man uh, has right-wing tendencies. He has been posting online and local media has been talking about how he'd made a specific post on a forum about the attacks in March that took place in Christchurch when a man went into two mosques there and killed over 50 people. We'll all remember that. That was a, an extraordinarily sad event. This man seems to have made a reference to that and has uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim sentiments and so that seems to have been his motive on this occasion. Uh, we'll see certainly what happens in the trial but Thankfully, this wasn't any worse. And thanks to that brave, the brave actions of that individual who pinned him to the ground. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And before we go, just how is the community responding to all of this? Shock and sadness, I think, is a fairly obvious. Look, there's about 200,000 people, Muslim people who live in Norway, a population of about 5 million. So it is a sizable minority. But they're saying to the authorities in Norway, look, look after us. We don't feel safe in this place. There is an uptick of anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim sentiment in that country. The authorities have put out, uh, they've ordered police to guard, uh, armed guards at uh, mosques throughout Oslo. It's not something that you usually see in Norway because the police aren't usually armed. Assault rifles, for example, also are totally banned in that country. So it does feel like a safe place a lot of the time. But the Muslim community is certainly asking that uh, authorities remain extra vigilant about them. All right, James Longman right there in London. Thank you so much for the updates. And we stay overseas um, to discuss a mysterious explosion that released radiation off the northern coast of Russia during a nuclear missile test. Um, seven people died, and American officials are racing to understand what happened. And our Ian panel has the latest. Ian? Kimberly, that's right. Growing fears of a small nuclear explosion in Russia that apparently killed seven, potentially involving a top-secret missile program. The explosion happened at a missile test site just off the northern coast of Russia on Thursday. The government initially saying there'd be no change in radiation levels, but local officials now saying that levels had briefly spiked. Residents nearby reportedly stocking up on iodine. That's used to reduce the effects of radiation. Officials saying that a small reactor had exploded during an experiment, but Russian officials remaining tight-lipped about exactly what happened and, most importantly, what was being tested. American and European intelligence and scientists are reported to suspect that this was part of a program to develop a new nuclear-powered missile that Russian President Vladimir Putin has claimed is able to reach anywhere in the world. Russia, of course, has a history of secrecy over accidents, the worst being the explosion at Chernobyl in 1986. Kimberly? All right, thank you, Ian, for that. And we move to Hong Kong, where all departing flights at one of the world's busiest airports canceled, completely canceled. Why? Because thousands of anti-government protesters continue to occupy the terminals for the fourth day. Again, this is the 10th week of unrest that comes over a controversial bill that would extradite criminals in Hong Kong back to mainland China. So I want to bring in um, Carson Yu, who is right there in Hong Kong with the latest. Um, Carson, can you just remind everyone um, what the people of Hong Kong want at this point? I can't believe. So you remember two months ago, over just over two months ago, Hong Kong people came out en masse to protest this extradition bill. But in the period since, it sort of moved on to other uh, complaints about the government and about Beijing's overreach into China. And increasingly, it's about police conduct in clearing out protesters. And today, specifically at the airport, the protesters are protesting against a very violent clearance operation last night in a shopping district where a protester was shot in the eye with a beanbag ring. Wow. So it got all these people out again into the airport and pretty much closing down the airport. And you, from the live pictures, you can see it thinned out a bit, but they were they effectively shut down one of the world's busiest airports today. Yeah, and so we're looking at the footage from the airport, but um, just to be clear, these protests have been happening all over the city, correct? That, that's correct. Uh, they've, ha they've, they've been, the protesters have 
had this motto, be like water. And they've been having this hit and run kind of campaign where they hit one district and then run to another district when it gets dispersed by police. So last night we were with protesters, all the protesters to seven districts in Hong Kong. So the numbers have kind of dwindled down from June, but they're uh, more widespread across the map in Hong Kong. Yeah, so again, we're seeing live pictures of um, the people, the protesters in the airport terminal right now. Um, Carson, there were also some reports that some of the officers um, across the city had apparently dressed up as undercover protesters. Yes, we were actually there last night when these undercover protesters or undercover cops. I'm sorry, undercover cops protesters. dressed up as protesters, yes. Under, under, undercover cops were making an arrest. They were mingling with protesters, and all of a sudden they just made an arrest. And, it, and we were there, and we saw the crowd kind of scattered, and people were furious because these cops apparently have been embedded with these protesters since uh, for a period of time, kind of trying to root out uh, the core protesters who've been attacking police installations. Yes, yeah, so the this. Police yeah, so this looks like it's going to continue to be a stalemate um, if there is no compromise. Uh, that, that, that's correct. I think after Beijing chimed in in the last couple of weeks, uh, the Hong Kong government has really uh, dug in to their position. And it seems from the rhetoric on both sides, there's no compromise. The protesters want their demands heard, but... The Hong Kong government and their leader, Carrie Lam, are unwilling to meet them halfway. And if, from everything we've seen on the field, uh, the kind of back and forth between the protesters and the police, this, uh, this co conflict needs a political resolution. All right. Well, that's Carson Yu uh, with us right there in Hong Kong with the latest. And we'll, of course, keep everyone updated on what happens. Um, so we're going to move on um, today. Ken Cuccinelli, who's the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services chief, he gave a briefing from the White House announcing a new rule that limits benefits for legal immigrants. So I want to bring in Serena Marshall, who's in our D.C. Bureau. Um, Serena, can you explain this new rule to us and what it means going forward? Kimberly, this is a huge change to legal immigration for the country. It no longer says that if you make, the, the rule says that not if you do qualify for public assistance like food stamps, for example, but if you may in the future qualify for public assistance, they can now deny your visa application or your green card. So this essentially has the impact of nearly cutting in half legal immigration to the United States. Now, immigrant advocate groups say that this is striking fear in immigrant communities. It's about a workaround from Congress because no longer will they need to prove their benefit to the country and that what they want to achieve. But if they may impact public benefits, they can be denied. This a country, uh, the, the Ken Cuccinelli is saying that we're going to go to essentially a points-based system. This is something we've heard from the administration for the past two years, something they wanted to move towards, but were unable to do it through Congress. So now they're essentially doing it on their own. Now, this has the impact of hitting American families as well. For example, there's a story out of Tampa where a father, an American citizen, his American citizen children stopped using food stamps because their immigrant mother uh, was going towards the green card process and they were worried because they qualified for food assistance that their mother would be denied entry into the United States, denied her green card because of their using this public benefit. So we are really seeing this rule, which will go into effect in October, hit immigrant communities, but also impact many American families. All right, Serena Marshall um, with the update there. Thank you so much. Um, kind of unbelievable. Thank you for um, the details. So we had Gilroy, California, El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio, a spate of mass shootings that jolted the country um, last week and left everyone on edge. If you remember, um, we showed you people running in Times Square after a motorcycle backfired because they thought it was gunshots. And now another legitimate scare um, in Houston at a mall where a suspect, a white male in his teens and a red half mask, jumped on a table in a food court and declared he was going to kill himself. Um, hundreds of people 
people fled, as you can imagine, and two were injured. So authorities are still searching for the suspects. So these mass shootings and domestic terror threats have completely shifted the 2020 conversation to gun control and gun legislation for the Democratic uh, presidential candidates, many of which are still in Iowa for the Iowa State Fair, um, the symbolic kickoff to caucus season. Um, so I want to take I want you to take a listen to what some of the candidates had to say about guns on the political soapbox. If Mitch McConnell doesn't call us back to vote on a bill, then when we are elected, I will give the United States Congress 100 days yeah. to pull their act together on this yeah. and put a bill on my desk for signature. And if they do not, I am prepared to take executive action. Mitch McConnell should call back the United States Senate today. I'll get on a plane and I'll be in D.C. so that we can pass the gun safety legislation passed in the House and do better. So you see them speaking there. And I want to bring in Adam Kelsey, um, who's been on the ground um, right there in Des Moines. So, Adam, can you just give us an idea of what's happening today? Uh, so good morning, Kimberly. Today here at the State Fair, we're getting a break from the presidential candidates. None of them scheduled to speak today, but that was after we heard from 21 candidates over the course of the first four days of the fair. And as you just heard, gun control at the top of a lot of those candidates' minds, not just here at the fair, but across town in downtown Des Moines, where there was a major gun control forum that attracted 16 of those candidates over the weekend. And what we heard from the Democrats in this race is broad agreement on some of the first steps that they can take in order to uh, address the issue of gun violence, things like universal background checks, uh, banning high capacity magazines, banning assault weapons as well. And what we heard from the senators in the race, as we just heard uh, from Kamala Harris and Bernie Sanders, is a call on the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to end the August recess and call them back to Washington, D.C., so they can begin to take action on some of the legislation that's already been passed by the House of Representatives on universal background checks. So Democrats, for the most part, whether they are moderates or progressives, <laughs> mostly united in this call for stricter laws as far as guns go. And there was some conversation about health care as well, yes? Yeah, Kimberly, that continues to be one of the top issues for voters when we talk to the folks here at the state fair. And what we're seeing is uh, the disagreements over Medicare for all versus reforming uh, the current system, the Affordable Care Act, uh, known as Obamacare, uh, continues to be the debate between the moderates and the progressives in this race. And there was quite the juxtaposition yesterday when we heard from Colorado Senator Michael Bennett, one of the moderates in this race, right before uh, independent Senator Bernie Sanders, the author of that Medicare for all bill. They went back to back on the soapbox here yesterday. Let's take a listen to what they said. I believe the fastest way to universal health care in this country is to give every family in America the opportunity to make a choice for their family whether they want to stay on the private insurance they have or whether they'd like a public option administered by Medicare. I just believe it. And I know Bernie's coming up here after me, so and 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 but I but I just don't believe that the American people are ready to take away insurance and the choice for insurance from 180 million Americans and charge the middle class in America $33 trillion in taxes. I don't believe it. What we have seen in poll after poll after poll is the American people want us to move to a Medicare for all single payer program. And that means no deductibles. That means no co-payments, means no premiums, means no out-of-pocket expenses, means freedom of choice to go to any doctor you want to go to, any hospital you want to go to, and we're going to phase that in over a four-year period. So Sanders there, along with Elizabeth Warren, attracting some of the largest crowds we've seen this weekend. Uh, but as I mentioned, this debate over health care, the Medicare for all on the progressive side, uh, those tweaks to the Affordable Care Act on the moderate side, and not a debate that we're expecting to go away anytime soon. Kimberly. All right. Adam Kelsey uh, right there in Des Moines. Um, and just before we go, um, what can we expect the rest of the week? Yeah. 
Yeah, so we've still got two more candidates the rest of the week. Seth Moulton next weekend and a big name, South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg, uh, who's been the talk of this fair, even though he hasn't been here yet, in second place in the cast your colonel uh, straw poll type tent that we've seen. Uh, he'll be here tomorrow speaking on the soapbox. All right. Thank you, Adam, so much for those updates. We appreciate it. And guys, after that horrific tragedy in Dayton, Ohio, um, a little bit of hope. As you know, a mass shooting in the city left nine people dead. Um, still a city still grappling with how to cope. Well, yesterday, um, John Legend, a native of Springfield, Ohio, made a surprise visit to Dayton. He spoke about gun reform and he did what he does best. He lifted spirits with songs. So he was right there in the Oregon district um, shopping with the mayor, um, speaking to the people. And then um, he was at Blind Bob's, a bar in the Oregon district, um, blessing the people with a song. And it was it was absolutely beautiful, um, something that the city needs. And speaking of legends, uh, can you say triple double? Um, because that will most likely be in your conversation this week if you're talking to your friends or your co-workers about Simone Biles. The gold medalist made history yet again by landing it, the first woman in history to ever do it. Watch it again right there, a triple double, her first pass on her floor routine. She's absolutely unstoppable. And we may not be able to do that, but we can at least take that energy into this week to be great and take care of yourselves. And I hope you guys continue to take care of yourselves. And if you're around, you can stick around for the briefing room at 3.30 p.m. And then you can check out World News Prime at 8 p.m. And if you want to stay updated on all of these headlines and these stories, you can go to abcnews.com or download the app. I'm Kimberly Brooks, and I will see you tomorrow.